Hey, good morning. It's Wednesday. Time for our check-in. We call it Coffee with PC. You probably know that. If you've checked in with me before, that's because I usually bring my cup of coffee. Uh, back to Double Double today. We had that, one of our favorites from way back. I, I finished up that a low acid coffee I found in our vacation. And this actually, they're, they're very similar, this one and that one. I'm enjoying both of them. Uh, I don't know, I, I, just something about it, one of my faves. So I got my cup of coffee today. It's Wednesday, a lot going on for us, a lot going on for you. It's been a fun week. We had our VPK graduation yesterday. And then this Sunday, we're gonna celebrate our high school graduates through our church. And then the week after that will be locally high school graduation. Graduation's a fascinating time, a, a huge accomplishment, uh, but it represents. Um, for us in our church and for these kids as they go into kindergarten, important steps in learning. And that, that got me thinking on a kind of an interesting and, I don't know, unrelated topic, but, but seemed to go together. Graduation, actually, the, the connection is, is, is more specifically literacy. It is, it is remarkable. And, and really, when we think about it, it's sort of a modern reality that literacy is taken for granted. You know, we start in our school. We've got VPKers who got four years old teaching them how to, how to write and read and do some basic things that, so by the time they get into kindergarten and first grade, you know, th those, those standards are there. That, that's, it's assumed that they need as soon as possible to get those basic literacy skills and then build on them throughout the career. Literacy is vitally important in our, our educational process and system, but it's also, a little bit of a relatively new thing, the, the ability to read particularly, because for long periods of history, the amount of quote reading material was minimal. I mean, I'm thinking about just my lifetime, the changes that have happened, and really the explosion there is in material that can be read. Um, I, we, we had for a while in our culture, uh, bookstores, particularly kind of the, the big box bookstores. I guess there are some still out there. Uh, things have changed even in the delivery of, of books and delivery being the key word. Uh, Amazon came on to, to the, the scene as the earth's biggest bookstore and mail order of books used to become a thing. But I remember I used to love to go to bookstores. Uh, they usually had a coffee shop in them and you could go in there and browse the books. You had areas where you could sit down. Um, there's, a, there's a new bookstore in the Keys I need to go check out. I haven't done that yet. It's been open for a while, but keep meaning to do that. Because why, why did we have those? Why did we go from the, the fascinating with libraries to, to, to these massive, you know, Barnes and Noble or whatever bookstores, these multi-floor bookstores where you could go and get lost because literacy was a given. People it was assumed could read and did read. And again, this is a relatively modern reality. Um, the printing press is a relatively modern invention, you know, only about what in the 1400s, 1500s is about the time it came in to being invented. And then through the printing press, being able to, to print more and different writing mediums that became available and much more affordable paper. And, and then the explosion of those things happened. I think I was reading that it was in the early 1900s that literacy, I think this was primarily American literacy, hit 70%. 70% of, of Americans at that point were literate. That's, pretty, that's a pretty good benchmark. But when did that happen? The 19, early 1900s, I wanna say 1920s, if I'm not mistaken, from reading about it recently. That, that is very recent. I, I say all that to, to say this, back, back to connecting it to the Bible. When I think about, this is, this is my preaching Bible, it's not my only Bible, it's probably, it's not the one I read the most, but it is the one I use on Sundays when I preach. Um, I don't know, that must be a preacher thing to have a quote, preaching Bible. But anyway, this is the one I use. Um, read it a lot, it's got a lot of marks in it, got a lot of things in it that I keep, teach from it on Wednesday nights. Um, it, it is remarkable that this is in my hand, that I have such incredible access to this. Uh, book. It is, it is incredible to think um, that that's the case. Now I could talk about it's, you know, the best selling book of all time and all. I don't want to go down that road except to remind us as believers the incredible treasure that we have in this book we call the Bible. The fact that we have it, uh, and a secondary way to put it, in our language is really remarkable. 
Again, a relatively modern invention as that goes, that we could mass produce Bibles and not only mass produce them, but mass produce them in the languages of different people groups, in our case, in English. Um, and, and then on top of that, to have the plethora of translations available of the Bible in our language. And then you add to that the fact that we have now in the palm of our hands, an app on our phone called the, the Bible app. version is the one I use. Maybe you're familiar with it. The Gideons have a Bible app as well, where you have literally hundreds, if not thousands of translations in various languages available to you to read. It is remarkable how as literacy sort of mushroomed over the last period of time and in, in the more modern times and, and the availability of printed material mushroomed, including the Bible, how we have this. But but here's the thing that all of that kind of brought home to me. And this, this is where I'm going. This is where I wanted to get to as I think about that. See, we have a bias. We all do. Every one of us have a bias. Uh, we have a bias that's based on our culture and our experience. And the, the thing that we usually do is look at the world through the lens that we're conditioned to look at it with. And, and I say that because in our culture, in our day, we look at the world through a lens of literacy that, that people read. It's, it's a given people read and write and have access to a, an incredible number of books, including the Bible. And so reading is a personal discipline. People like to read, but most people, when they read, except if you're reading to your child or something like that, or maybe in a classroom, you read quietly by yourself alone and you and you read. Now that's a good thing. It's something I enjoy doing. I've got a lot of books, but, but, but here's the thing. That is a modern and Western ideal, both literacy and individuality. And because those are modern things, we superimpose them over all of history. And, and again, relating to Bible, relating to Christianity, we have at times made our Christianity a personal and private reality, including how we interact with the book we call the Bible. It is a personal thing. In fact, one of my least favorite phrases is when people say, I have Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Why is that my least favorite phrase? I, I get the point, and I've probably used it before, that, 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 that as an individual, I want to have a confessed faith in Christ and be a Christian. But again, that's a very modern, Western, individualistic view of faith. It's, it prioritizes the person. I have a personal relationship with Jesus as my Savior. See, here, here's what, what I would counter with that. The truth is we need to understand is Jesus is Savior, whether personally <laughs> that's what I'm professing or not. Jesus is Lord, we would proclaim, and the scriptures would teach whether personally I've appropriated it or not. And so that idea is, is kind of important. So we, we take the, the personal individualistic element and realize in the history of faith, in the vast history of faith expression, it has not been a personal relationship with Jesus as Savior. It's been a communal relationship with Jesus as Savior. Part of it relates back to literacy. If literacy is not normative, if not everybody can read, and secondly, if the presence of printed material is not everywhere and easily available, well, then it stands to reason that if I can't read and I don't have access to, in this case, the, the text of the scriptures, where would I get that? How would I have access to it? I would have access to it in a community where I gathered with others to hear it read and discussed and talked about. It is the really the design of God from, from the, the, the period of the church age, the New Testament, that we exist, we live in community, that, that, that faith is not simply meant to be a me, myself, and I think that. Again, a modern, Western, individualistic view 
of faith, not necessarily a biblical view. That's why our modern cultural realities shape the way we look at our faith and sometimes shape it not so helpfully, sometimes shape it to our detriment. We were designed for community. We were designed for relationship, ultimately with God, yes, but also with other individuals. And so it's in that community, particularly a community of faith, sometimes we call that a local church congregation, that God desires that we unite and join and read and study and learn together. Because again, in the history of faith traditions, that is overwhelmingly the way it was done. Yes, sometimes by necessity, but just because our modern convenience make it less necessary doesn't make it less important. So all of that to say, I encourage you, I hope that you know Jesus personally as Savior and Lord. I hope that you would consider yourself a believer, a Christian, that you recognize Jesus died for your sins and you placed your faith in him and you want to follow him. And I'm going to suggest to you that if that's the case, the way that we are made to do that is with other people in community, in groups, with life-to-life -life interaction, uh, with those things where we read together, we study together, we learn together, we, we, as our character rubs up against each other, we shape each other by those collective experiences. Um, so in some ways you say, hey, this just sounds like you're saying I should go to church. Yeah, I guess if you wanna boil it down, uh, that, that's true. But more than that, more than just, hey, I think you should go to church, or I think you should come to my church. I think you should go to whatever church that, that teaches and, and lives by the scriptures. That's the most important thing. But, but I want to remind us that, and, and boy, this could be a series of things, and, and I could go a lot of ways, but I'm just going to sum it up this way. Be careful that we don't let our modern, Western, individualistic lives influence the way we read it. By the way, it does. It influences the way I read it. It influences the way you read it. And it influences everything we do. But we have to guard against letting it be the determinative way we read and interact and study and learn from the scriptures. God designed us for community. God designed us to be with others, to, to learn alongside, to serve alongside, to sometimes get annoyed alongside, and to grow alongside and other believers in him. So please find that place so that you can do what the church historically, yes, by necessity has had to do, but more than that, by design, God created us to do and to be. Find that group, find that, that community of faith that allows you to grow and to study and to learn and to have the character of Christ more and more built into you. When we read the Gospels, particularly the last point, and then I'll wrap up. When we read the Gospels particularly, what do we read? We read the story after story of Jesus interacting with people. There are a few places where we get sermons. There are a few places where, like the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters in Matthew, it's Jesus sitting on the side of a mountain and, and teaching. But more than that, it's, it's interacting. It's Jesus life on life with individuals, whether his own disciples, whether people in the community he comes into contact with, people curious about him, people that need his help or healing, people that are against him and opposed to him that he has interactions with. Why? Because that's his model. He, he lived, he came to earth, the son of God, to live in community and, and ultimately to bear the penalty for our sins as the example that we are made for that life on life interaction. That's what best helps us grow in our faith, not the individualistic uh, Western literate mindset that we just sit in our corner and we read for pleasure. We do our thing and make it personal. Yes, it is personal. It means something to me, but it's expressed in community. All right, I'm going to wrap up now. I, I guess I got a little carried away, but I, that was just on my mind after our graduation. It's always cool every year when we see our VPKers graduate and we see our high schoolers graduate and take the next step in life. So we'll be praying for them as they go into kindergarten, as they go into college or the career field or tech school or wherever they go. I hope this week you'll celebrate somebody that's had maybe a milestone achievement. Let them know how proud you are of them 
and encourage them in the next step of life. Why? Because that's what we're made to do. Life on life, encouraging, growing, supporting each other. You try to do that with somebody this week. I hope you receive that from some people this week. And until we meet again, whether it's Sunday in worship at nine, whether it's next Wednesday on this video, Coffee with PC, either way, I look forward to touching base with you soon. Take care.